You're listening to Grove Street Journal. Enjoy the show. And here we are, Ali. Thanks for joining me today. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. I'm glad that it's raining outside, if I'm honest. Really? Yeah. What? I love this time in Vancouver. What's, what's going on with that? Because I have a crazy thing about me being a psychopath and absolutely loving the rain. So this is, I'm, I'm quite happy with the clouds settled and the fog and the one hour drive back and forth. Yeah. The rain actually makes it pretty nice. I mean, the only way I can say if you love the rain and you're a psychopath, do you, do you, do you specifically love it because it inconveniences other people? Like, <laughs> mm, I've never thought about it that way. I actually love rain because of my favorite author and like one page of my favorite book and he describes the rain. And I, after reading that, I was like, mm, I want to live in the rain for the rest of my life. <laughs> I want to live in the rain. Yeah. And like, especially because I love driving, but not on nice days because then you feel like you're taking away like oh I should be out there doing something I don't feel obligated to have to go and do a bunch of stuff which is why I'm like I'm pretty comfy inside right now okay yeah, yeah. I can I can feel that for yeah. sure I can get behind that even I, yeah. I you know if you have the luxury of being able to stay indoors the rain is perfect for that yeah I always just think I always have like a picture of like a crackling fire in my head and just like blankets and just cozying up yeah. smoking some weed reading a book that's, that's, or Netflix, like anything related, and it just, it's soup season. Nice. So there's just all of those wonderful things that... The only together. problem is I have two dogs, and they do not accept rain as a valid excuse not to get their two walks a day. That is fair. And then it's like the whole drying process. That is the worst thing. Because they're also very spoiled. They, not only do they have the two walks, but then in the evening, when we settle down to watch TV or whatever in the living room, you know, they just stand by the door and they're like, let, let us out. And you have to let them out and then they play in the yard. They get super muddy and wet. You have to clean them every time you come in. Yeah. It's a nightmare. You know? I could see how that's like, you would be like, oh, it's because it inconvenience other people, but I don't have a dog. So <laughs> that's <is true. laughs> But I did get stuck in the rain. Like, gosh, it was probably like two, three weeks ago. Um, another great quality that I have is we have a cat carrier, like a stroller that we zip our children into, our fur babies, and we take them for a walk. And Brilliant. I got stuck in the rain <gasps> oh, with no. my two cats. <laughs> we were like 15 minutes from the house. So I had to like de-robe myself and walk in like only a sweater and pouring rain and like cover them up. Oh and my God. So was it like, the, it was so torrential that there was, it was like flooding and just no, like- No, it wasn't, it was probably about today, but I mean, it, it's still, Cats it can rain. really belt it out here. Yeah. Like when it wants to rain, I don't think I've seen rain like this anywhere else. Really? It's like a freaking monsoon rolling in. Even from being from like the UK and Europe, because yeah, like you no, guys like, have. It, I don't know. Like, it, I feel like we do have a similar level of rain, but what I'd say is my wild hypothesis is that it probably rains more frequently in the UK, but it's more like drizzle. It drizzles like a very English mist. thing. Just like, oh, it's a bit, just a bit drizzly. But here, yeah, or like a mist. But here, yeah. you know, you go through like those periods of like four or five days of just intense yeah. rain. And you're like, I don't remember if there is a different state of weather from this or whether, whether it was just always this way. Totally. And like, we just moved from not too far from here, maybe like 15 minutes um, west. And now we live like an hour into the valley, into Fraser Valley. And so that change, we didn't think that the weather was going to be that different. Maybe we get more snow is completely different because we're stuck so close to the mountains, but also like half in the valley. So we have this small pocket where things just like to chill out for a little bit extra long. Mm -hmm. And literally every day when I walk out of my house and I get in the car and I start driving, it is one thing on one side and one thing on the other. And it's so weird because things won't pass over the mountains. That's crazy. And they won't pass through to the other side of them. So we get stuck with, I mean, it was gorgeous out yesterday morning. And I was like, oh, I can go to the, to the river. I can hang out, bring my chair, smoke a doobie. Like an hour or two passes and it was just black. I don't know. Didn't even see it coming. A little microclimate going on. Yeah. It's, it's actually the same thing. I lived in Fernie for a little bit and 
um, we used to go camping at uh, Lake Kukunusa and you, um, you drive out of Fernie and there's this one little bit where you go, I think it's like a small tunnel but it's like drilled through a mountain essentially and it's such a small tunnel, it's I don't know like 25, 30 foot, you're, you're through it and it can be literally raining, like storm, awful in Fernie and you get through that tunnel and it's, and it's blue sky and yeah. sun and it's so trippy, but it's awesome. You want it that way because that's where you're going camping. So it's always yeah. like, okay, I don't know if this is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Like fingers crossed for the tunnel, yeah. blue sky. We've, we've done that. Uh, cause we're like 20 minutes from Stave Lake and it's gorgeous being in that position where if we wanted to come into the city, it's actually a longer drive than going into the mountains, which is why we moved. Um, and there's been times where it has been just pouring, just dumping rain and we just don't care. We're like, cool, good thing we have the truck. Hmm. This is gonna make for some really sketchy off-roading. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes it for a really good time and like we set up the tents and what are they called, tarps? Yeah. 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 Um, and we set all of those up with like a fire and then you do shrooms in the rain and that that is like bliss for me. I just sit there. I'm so happy and I don't even care if I'm under a tarp or not at that point just because it's it's refreshing and when people are like oh you know you can like smell the rain or oh it just rained yeah. like that shit oh, it gets me every time right there. yeah I love that I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm that guy I'm like guys it's gonna rain in about 10 minutes like did you feel that temperature drop yeah. temperature just <laughs> 10 minutes mark my words I, yeah, I love that shit. It's, um, it's nice. It's almost like a perspective. Like if you just want to resist the rain, then it will be shitty. But if you just embrace it, I'm more thinking like, okay, well, I've got to go take the dog for a walk. And I'm looking outside and it's pretty miserable. And I go, oh, fuck, I'm just going to put my rain jacket on. Like I'm not going to get wet. Yeah. Um, and even if I do, yeah, sometimes I'd be in the woods, just put my hood down and just get wet. And it's just epic. It just feels so nice. Yeah, and there's something about it, like my biggest thing, especially because we've gone on so many family vacations the last couple of years, the moment that it rains and I'm near a body of water that I can jump into, that is my favorite thing in the world. Nice. And like we've been in the middle of not fucking nowhere in Thailand on a boat in the middle of like massive bodies of water and it started to just drizzle and even my mother-in-law was like, stop the boat. She's got, she's got to do a thing. <laughs> and I get so excited. And it's, I don't know, it's, I love being around water. Should have been a Pisces apparently, but I do really just enjoy it. And it's- Do you like to swim as like a recreational thing as well? No. No, nope. just just like a dip in and out. Well, yeah, like yeah. I'm not gonna go in there and breaststroke for 45 minutes. That's me, I'm just like, you know, I'm like a wind up thing, you put me in the wall. No. Going around until I get out. I just love it. I just love to float and just to kind of enjoy it. And it's a nice weight off of my back, especially after surgery. So it's just, I don't know, buoyancy is nice to have gravity kind of. It's a, it's a great way off. of re rehabilitation. Because it it's is. like a low impact, it's gentle on your body. Yeah, and like some of the first exercises that I really got to do was after everything kind of was healed and I was able to move around in a pool. And I was like, oh my God. Did you mind me asking about your surgery? No, you can't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, of course. Um, long story short, I'm six foot three and have always had joint issues. Um, lots of people didn't believe that like I was injured all the time, but they were like full blown scan showed, you know, needed a full shoulder replacement. And when you say people didn't believe, are you talking about like people in the medical uh, realm? No, or medical just... totally, but like I played volleyball for years. And when you're an athlete who just like continuously is getting hurt and you're like, what is going on with this? And you think, oh, I'm just pushing myself too much. And it's, it's that, um, I ended up needing like a full reconstruction of my shoulder before I was 20, uh, and fully opted out of that ended up getting into cannabis because of it. Um, but my back has always bugged me, especially in my lower back. Um, it's all the bending and all the, even sitting at a sink, doing the dishes, if you're tall and that counter is not the right height that slight pressure that you're putting on your back all the time uh just wore out uh my vertebrae so on my l4 l5 i had a herniated disc super fun um that was 2019 yeah um just woke up fell asleep on the couch and had like a little pinch and i was like oh probably pinched a nerve or whatever 
um, ended up being, yeah, the herniated disc, uh, misplaced nerve. Uh, and then I also had bone spurs, which is when you have arthritis and your bones rub together and they start growing back. Um, so they had to go in and pretty much take out those bone spurs, reposition the nerve and then fix the herniated disc all in between two vertebrae, which was a lot happening when you're, gosh, what was I like 23 at the time? Um, a week before, no, not a week, like a day before I went to the surgeons um, to get like the full evaluation, make sure I got my scans, all of that kind of fun shiz, and COVID hit. Oh, no. <laughs> and then we literally get the call like after the news broke there, like everything's postponed and it took like another year to get the scans. Um, and then they were like, yep, you're going to need the surgery if you want it. It's like, yes, <laughs> I would love that. Uh, and then March last year, when had the surgery, it was about a year and a half, two years between the initial waking up on the couch, something isn't right, um, until I actually got the surgery. And there were points where like, when people talk about phantom limb, where I would literally stand up and my leg was just gone. Like no feeling, no nothing. And like I had lost something around like 70, 80% of all of my feeling from the waist down on my right side. So I had no clue that some of the things that ended up coming back, thank God. Um, yeah, just, I had no idea that that shouldn't feel like that way because after such a long period of time, it was just so much pressure and amazing pains and feelings and whatnot. So like you couldn't drive, like you couldn't drive for two years, which was- That's huge. Yeah. It's like in Canada, that's huge. You would, yeah. uh, I really rely on a car around here to get around. It's a big bloody place. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it was difficult, but after the surgery, there was definitely a lot of progress that happened and blessed and highly favored to have ref uh, refused all opioids and did all cannabis recovery wow. instead, had that approved by every surgeon and anybody medically involved, like Brilliant. massage therapists, physios, nurses, family doctor, like everybody. And has it been effective for pain? Oh, absolutely. Like when the surgery that i had um it was a laminectomy and a discectomy so all of those things i was describing earlier and when you leave the hospital you're walking like you get put in a wheelchair but like i had to stand up and walk myself to the car um and the next day they were like you have to walk 20 minutes after spinal surgery and it was one of those new re rehabilitations that you have to like get up and go um, so yeah, that's, I, I always think that's a scary thing because on one side, okay, you want to start rehabilitating it on another side. I think personally, I'd be feeling, you know, scared and, and trepidatious of not wanting to fucking do, go too quick yeah. and damage something again. And that was a big thing, especially me being so fucking impatient with everything that I do. Um, it was definitely a struggle. However, I wasn't zombied out. And that was the biggest thing is I don't want to feel loopy or not like myself, or if I am doing this stuff, not feel um, myself enough or um, present enough to be able to go through that recovery. And so when we opted for cannabis, I was like, that's going to be so much fun being oh, like extremely fucking high for the week that I did take off of work, uh, cause I work from home. So I'm going to get bored <laughs> after surgery. Anyways, I can <laughs> work like this. Um, and it just ended up becoming a way better experience. I really got to enjoy my time instead of not being able to, my partner says that I was extremely annoying, uh, in his eyes. I thought I was hilarious. <laughs> I know I was, um, but it, it made it that much more enjoyable. Um, and when you're, when you have something like a surgery and you want to use cannabis as a recovery method, it works differently in your body. So for probably the two days after I was taking a thousand milligrams of THC and a thousand milligrams of CBD. It was a lot. It's a high dose. It is. Um, but 
I'm, I'm sorry, were you like, was that oil, edibles, flour? Oil, edibles, no inhalation for 10 days okay. because of coughing possibly and just oxygenation oh, for my body and a slight break. Um, so I had to work up that tolerance leading up to it. I didn't just roll out a thousand milligrams a day. It would be horrible on your body if you didn't prep for it and build up that tolerance. Um, but I, I wasn't in as much pain, but I wasn't high even if I did take like a 300 milligram brownie. That's awesome. And so it's just where everything's redirected in, in your body. So it was being all absorbed into my back and not into my brain. And that's, that's a beautiful thing about cannabis, which I actually discussed with Dr. Ethan Russo on one of the very first podcasts that I did. Um, and why it's so good in this kind of setting is like you say, you build up a tolerance to the high which in this case is, an, is a side effect. Um, however, the, uh, the efficiency and the effectiveness in terms of the therapeutic values, that doesn't diminish. Whereas no. with an opioid-based medicine, you need to continually keep ramping up doses just to achieve the same level of, of pain reduction. Yeah, and like it, eventually we, when the wound had healed um, or incision site had healed, we started doing more topicals and I got to do the bath bombs more and the things that I knew really, really helped. Cause there were days, where, like I said, like nothing in my leg, half an hour in the tub with a bath bomb and I'm moving my toes. I'm able to actually put weight on my leg. Like it was crazy things that we found out what worked and what didn't. Um, but definitely like, I think it was day three or four. Um, I forgot to put back in my nose rings after surgery and I was able to actually stand up and kind of shuffle <laughs> throughout our apartment by myself. It's like, oh damn, I gotta put these back in. And they had regrown just slightly, so you kind of have to pop it on top of like the hundreds of milligrams of whatever I had taken that day. It made me so sick. And that was the one downfall is like, when you do take a lot of edibles, you can get nauseous. And that plus the pain I had plus a nice little adrenaline rush to my body, I was I was done for that was, for uh, a little bit. Yeah, tipped you over. Yeah, uh, edibles are for, for I, I pre approach them with caution. You know, I've done the very textbook thing: brownies too much. Yeah, high for like two days, and I was just like I was just on the sofa. Like there were four of us. And we all just like, you know, started off innocent enough, put some videos on YouTube, but like, <laughs> well, this is pretty strong actually. And then it's just like waves, waves. And you're like, whoa, it's ramping up. Oh, okay. It just ramped up again until you know, just, we're just on the sofa. And to this day, it sounds so fucking stupid, but to this day, one of the hardest things I've ever done is we ordered pizza and we lived in like a complex. And so I had to get out across the courtyard of the complex and then da like in an elevator down a couple of floors, to then go and meet the pizza driver. And it was just like, it was so hard, like the mental effort to remove myself from the sofa. And I was like, I've got to, like, these guys need to eat. Like I've got to do this. You yeah. Know? It's and edibles do like, I know people usually get this from any kind of consumption of cannabis, but it's that, whoa, I've been sitting here for a really long time. And I don't think I've said anything. Maybe I should say something. Hmm, that's a neat thought. <laughs> <laughs> You're just back to something. Like there's nothing. Yeah. There's no thoughts on, like, in the universe. That's me when I, get, when I have too much edibles. My poor, beautiful friends, Marta and Mikey. Hey, guys. Uh, they took us out. Uh, gosh, where were we? Like somewhere downtown we went to the beach and they took us out to we went for pre-drinks then they were like oh there's this great fried chicken place took us out there and i had taken an edible and by the time that we hit that fried chicken place i was just glazed over and i knew that they were talking and telling really good stories and they're great people and i just there were no words that i could find to come out of my mouth in that night and the whole time i could kind of tell that they knew and then the next day she texted me and she was like, you were so ripped, man. I have not seen you like, like you said no words. Devin had to speak for you. And I was like, oh, he spoke for me. I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, it's kind of my fear being in like public places when I'm, when I'm too high. Cause I just, sometimes I become 
are uber self-conscious and then I'm like, <laughs> what's going on? Yeah, it's, it's not a good thing. And I've, therapy is such a beautiful, amazing thing in this world where it teaches you how to deal with your anxiety. And I just applied that to anxiety triggered highs. So if I do find myself getting into that, oh, I don't love this feeling moment, I just go, what is the one thing that is doable that will make me happy to refocus what I am doing? I'll deal with whatever that is after. Um, and so you use it to kind of, you retrain your brain to go, ooh, I don't like what's happening right here, but something I do like, and then just go do that. And so do you have an example, like uh, like like a TV show, or like to have to yeah. be a specific thing? Or Literally just... anything, like my go-to is my cats. Nice. Um, they're usually there anyways, and I'm like, oh man, I'm not feeling really good about myself for whatever reason, high or not. And I'm like, oh, this is fur baby, hello, thing that loves me, and I can take care of, and just chill out with, or, food work like I get extremely high every day all day right and I can actually work have the functioning high blessing to be able to do that um, and if I go and you know we're in a meeting or I'm on my own and I've hit a couple too many dabs and I'm like whoa I'm really overwhelmed yeah like, I have a lot of shit to do I'm like yeah but what one seems the most fun yeah. So then that's when I pick up my side project and I'm like, nice. I'm going to write this cool thing or, oh, I should hyper focus. That doesn't take a ton of work. We're doing photos today. Nice. And it's, it's that. Kind but of even thing. then the photos I find like, and it comes down to, for me, whether I'm doing something that requires me to be doing something novel and new or something that I've done before. And that is usually the distinction for me. If it's something new and novel, if I'm too high, I just, it's not a good time for me to do that. But anything else, so like photos, used to be when I was first taking them, that getting high would be a really bad idea because I haven't really done it before. So I'm like, okay, I need to set up the lights. I need the camera. I need to think about what lens I'm using. I need to make sure the freaking SD cards in there and all that stupid shit, which is easy to, f to forget when you're just like learning to do it. Yeah. Getting high for that was not a good idea for me. But like now, like, yeah, I get some music going in my room and like, I don't have to think about those things because they've become sort of more yeah. muscle memory. And you want to do things that you've kind of either trained your brain for or have muscle memory with. And that's why a lot of people I find like to smoke or have something cannabis related before they work out because you can exhaust mm -hmm. that anxiety really fucking quick. Hell yeah. And it is a really good thing to do. So. I, I don't have a go-to thing that I do. It's literally, what do I want to do that's gonna make me feel better than what I'm feeling right now? Because that's that cannot last long, not in my space. Yeah. So if it's dealing with it, cool, yeah, maybe I'll meditate. Maybe if I'm like, ooh, that's a, that's a really deep, dark, twisty thought. We're gonna take care of that right now. And so it honestly just depends on what I do. I have the same routine every day if it happens in the same order it's totally out of the fucking window <laughs> so the why are you talking me for your routine I'm, I'm curious and, and i guess just we'll provide some context here for the listeners uh, you're you're a freelancer and yes. you so uh, i'm really interested because a lot of challenges around having no structure um imposed by anyone else to your day which for me, go, going into that kind of thing, it's the first time and it's an intoxicating, it's powerful, it's uh, empowering, but it can also have be a challenge, right? Yeah. So talk me through. Oh, what's this? You just press that little button. Okay. <coughs> it's strong though. Um, thanks for royalty, concentrates, you guys rock. <coughs> this button at the bottom? Or? Uh, no, it's like a little flat one. It's this one? Great. Oh, okay. It'll be... Oh yeah, this yeah, yeah, one. Yeah. Okay, so you just, just like a key cocky or something. Yeah. Like that. The Toki team, Team Toki for the win. Um, my routine. So th that's a huge thing. And I actually just worked on an article this week that was being about productive at home. Um, people have seen, I'll pick up a camping chair and I'll throw it by the river brink. And if it's a warm enough day, I'll just sit there and do what I need to do. I have a hotspot, I have a notebook, I have an iPad. I can download whatever I need to, to, to do it outside. So if I go to the park or whatever, um, but I still kind of, keep things as best as I can because ADHD tendencies are also a thing for me. Um, and you really have to give yourself room to kind of 
not have a structure within a structure <laughs> yeah which is super again adhd of me so what i did to start off is every day i give myself like my wake up time and in my calendar i have these massive blocks of time anything that fits relevantly into that time i will do during that time so i have my wake up time that could be that's definitely coffee um depending on what i have planned for the day it might also be a tea um, but usually it's two coffees. Um, I do a little bit of a stretch, skin routine, whatever. Um, and usually I don't eat, but I definitely have my CBD in the morning because I won't have THC without CBD. Um, and would you take that in an oil form? Usually an oil form right. in my coffee. I have this great one-to-one -one orange flavor tincture and it makes my coffee taste like a chocolate like a chocolate Christmas orange those ones that you snack Ooh, that's and that nice just treat. makes my soul happy I love those by the way yeah but I you know if I'm getting one in chocolate bars I eat the whole I eat the whole orange I have no self-control over they those do chocolate other orange. forms now I've seen the bars but flavors. I love I love the, the wheel yeah you and really the want circle it. just like boom. yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's just so satisfying <laughs> Um, after that, I usually have a work time, which is any general work that could be searching for a new gig. It could be my meetings. Um, again, I kind of have a list of things that will qualify for that time in my calendar. Um, after that is a project time. So I either dedicate it to the project that I'm doing on the DL um, or any major projects that I'm doing, but it is project focused. That could also be my prime time uh, when the lighting is great in our kitchen uh, for doing videos. So if I'm going to cook, it's usually at that time as well. Then there's an open break for whatever I feel like. It's not scheduled, it's just blank. And then I have care time um, at the end of my day. And then that is usually yoga, probably more cooking if I'm not already cooking. Um, and around that 420 mark is when I'm really hungry. It's when I usually start eating in a day, depending on how early I wake up. Um, and then that's usually also when I crack a beer. And then anything that happens after five o'clock is usually back on the computer doing anything that I didn't wrap up earlier in that day or if I got distracted by something else, but give myself a little bit more room to work. Um, and maybe do chores or putts around, but I do try and have periods of time that allow me to do the random crazy things that I enjoy. And how, how long, like how many hours is your typical work day, would you say? That's also another thing. If I don't have anything, I'm not gonna sit myself down if I don't have to, or I'm gonna only focus on the things that I personally wanna do. Like I've been wanting to do this recipe or write this story or hop on a call with a friend. Um, I would say it usually does add up to eight hours now that I'm doing freelancing. Um, but I mean, there are still days that I find myself in front of a computer for like 14 hours. Yeah. Whether or not that's relevant consulting or freelancing or just my own stuff is a different question. <laughs> <laughs> and do you find, cause for me personally, like I find when I wake up in the morning, I'm very, focused and it's almost like my best time probably for um, high intellectual intensity work um, I'm usually just like drilling through emails or like that kind of stuff which actually may be a waste of that that window who knows um, yeah. and then in the in the afternoon I kind of like more of the creative things but I'm you know not quite as sharp you know I'm more yeah creative I think it depends on the time that I get up because usually when I'm having my coffee and putzing around and doing whatever I need to, I kind of go through, even before I wake up, I check my emails and all of my socials, whatever notifications have popped up and go through that and then kind of take a break. Nice. Usually that's when I stretch or do something um, or clean up because I just left a mess of bag of chips or whatever the night before um, and kind of get myself set up for the day. But I, I don't think that there's usually a time where I prefer to do stuff. It honestly depends on the task itself. Like if there's something really interesting, like if I'm going through a digital audit, I won't leave my computer probably for like three, four days Wow. because it's crazy. in my brain and I want, everything to kind of plug into it and when you give yourself space 
to get distracted or to go and do something else or go, mm, I'm stuck on this. I know I'm going to get more stuck if I just sit here and pressure myself yeah. to get through that That's walk. Um, it's that whole, the best ideas come in the shower. Oh yeah, they do. They can come through at other times of the day. If you give yourself times to actively, productively procrastinate. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I think it's the same with meditation. It's like you have to take your mind off the issues to create the space. Obviously like your subconscious things going on beneath the surface to come to fruition. Yeah. And as long as you're able to give yourself that extra space, it really helps you calm down. Um, like even around my house now, I'm not as frantic if I'm like, Oh, I got to clean. Like, for what? Like, take your time through. You don't have to be running from room to room, hitting into shit. I'm a lot less clumsy now that I've gone into freelancing because my brain doesn't have to function at such a high rate. And I was working EST times before. So meeting starting at 6 a.m. and then finishing around 2 o'clock. We had engineers that worked in Europe. So I would crash in the middle of the afternoon after 4.20 for a couple hours, wake up for a couple hours in the middle of the night, crash again and did like a split sleeping schedule and it worked for someone like me with the just mass amounts of whatever i want to do um and i do find myself if i don't have obligated meetings to go to i go back into that routine because it works for me really really well yes. and as long as hold that for because we just have to take a quick break reset the camera that's fine but we will be back before you know Okay, so we're back, and yeah, we're, we were just talking about the uh, the freelancing yes. and the structure of the day, and um, different elements of the day is like different sides of different strengths of working. Yeah, and there's just one more thing that like I kind of wanted to plug in here, and it's another amazing book. And for people who don't want to waste time on the book, they can go and watch the TED Talk. Uh, it's this brilliant dude called Adam Grant. Um, I can't remember the company, but remember when those like kids in some uni class put together glasses um, and they were selling eyeglasses, like prescription glasses on an e-commerce store and it blew up and this was like years ago um, and no one expected them to make millions. Like they took off immediately and investment went crazy over them. Their professor rejected investing in their company because he asked them all of these questions that you should know before you launch a company. And it was right before the deadline of their launch. And he didn't think that they had their shit together. Let lo and behold, they went and fucking crushed it. And he came up with this really interesting theory called the originals. So for him in simplicity, there's two kinds of people, procrastinators and overachievers. Well, what about the people in between? And his whole thing was there's people who procrastinate but are able to boom out their work because they've given themselves the time to think about it and distract themselves from it that when they come back to that project to finish and boom it out, they're able to because consciously or subconsciously they have continuously thought about how important it is and how they have to get it done, but they're not ready to do it yet. And so when it comes to crunch time, people are able to kind of just roll it out because you've given that room for your brain to shut down in one area and have that, oh, light bulb in the shower moment. Yeah, I 100% like vibe that with that as well. All the time. Yeah. And for me, I was like, yeah, that's, that's my vibe because university even, I had a schedule. I, I had the most organized planner out of anybody. Did I do it? No. Did I start when I said I was going to? No. What I would do is throw together a template of what I wanted it to be. And then as things kind of ventured on, or I would have a thought, oh, this would be a really good sentence, but I don't know where it's going to go. I just know that this is one of the things and then just throw it in there. And then when it came to crunch time and we all had to sit down and pull our all nighters and boom a, you know, 15,000 essay out in a week, it was easy because everything I planned it out, but I had to, you just had to execute. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. No, I, I, I feel that for sure. 
Um, that's a, that's an interesting and you know, so Adam Grant. I definitely look into that, and it's it's quite a common thing. The example of these kids selling glasses. Um, I, the couple of examples I always think of as J.K. Rowling with Harry Potter mm -hmm. to that book to like, I don't know the exact number of publishers, but it was a lot. Said no, 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 and then you get the one yes, and you know <clears throat> we all see the success and celebration and think it's unattainable without always seeing the long string of failures that that inevitably lead up to the yeah. moment where it all turns around. And it's coming at things like with a different perspective than you would because over time things are going to change. And I, I hate the expression that was wasted time because that's not yeah. a true thing because it's. Whatever you've done and thought you wasted your time on, it's going to play out to lead to something else. So even if you do spend 10 hours watching Netflix or 15 hours a day on a job that you didn't think is going to be anything for you, you're going to find yourself looking back and going, oh, but it led me here, yeah. which is such a stupid thing to be like, life goes on and, you know, everything's worth it and it means something, but it, it does. And so relationships or friendships or whatever like it's not wasted time even if it isn't the best scenario it's going to teach you something or lead to i agree something i think we're, we're, we're too fixated oftentimes on like the end result or having success or having financial freedom or any of these kind of things and i almost feel that um part of that by the way is just the fact that a lot of us are struggling like you know it's it's a tough world out there like house prices like gas now you know wages are not what they used to be compared to inflation like all of these factors are compounding so and i always fucking drone on about maslow's hierarchy of needs so i don't know if you've seen this like triangle of like human needs and, and right at the bottom is just like your very basic securities and having a roof over your head and shelter and basic yeah. needs and uh so a lot of us you know when you're further down there you you can't you're just thinking like day to day on the little things um and you're thinking you've like this far off thing of success without really understanding what it is or how you're going to achieve it but by getting just into like the day to day and having maybe that comfort and space where you can say, look, I don't know where my finished product is going to be or necessarily yeah. what it looks like, but I have faith in this process and that, you know, it's just a journey. And like you say, these things, they may be seemingly un un inconsequential, but looking back and you think, wow, like these things that I did were very important. Um, yeah. And like the whole thing too, is like when you're saying there's all these contributing factors and so many things, you know, can weigh you down. Like everybody's got a shit pile and that whole, Oh, someone's got it worse than you. Well, yeah, no shit. Like I get that, but that's not to say that what I have weighing on me isn't fucking significant because it is like, it doesn't matter what it is, but it is significant to me and that's all that matters but when you look at all those things and you start getting overwhelmed by housing prices or the wages or you know all of those complaints that could happen even in cannabis industry like compliance like marketing restrictions all that look at it and go why the fuck not do it a different way then mm -hmm. why am i sitting here complaining one, especially if you're not getting off your ass and doing something yourself, like stop complaining about compliance or anything in the market that you're not happy with. If you're not donating to an association, you're not volunteering for an association, you're not with an organization that's doing something to change those because it's easily accessible. Um, there's so many programs to change shit, like go. You're talking about, you know, legalization versus decriminalization, go support normal like they're a massive group like it's it's not that hard and if you're able to apply like apply that to everything else that you're doing like why okay yeah it's fucking shit but why not still do something in that time it's gonna it's, 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 it's easy just to, to complain and it's it's yeah i don't know is it the society we're living in where like it, you know you could just go say some things on social media and feel like you've made an impact or you know update no your way. profile picture to, to show something or or whatever yeah. and it's like it's easy you don't really have to think about it too much and it's something that makes you feel better about yourself well and like nobody thought that 
when Facebook started and you're on MSN, you know, <laughs> in middle school or high school chatting with your friends or whatever, nobody thought that would lead to the fact that you can make millions a year dancing on an app. Nobody, nobody thought that. And not to, you know, bring that down. TikTok is actually fucking fantastic when it comes to a lot of different aspects of showing kind of where we lie. But that was from people going, why not see what happens? <laughs> like roll the dice, who cares? And it's as simple as spending their couple hours a day to be able to eventually afford a secondary apartment to make into a content house to make the things that you're trying to make like that's that's wild people never saw that happening when when people started looking at ai programming or graphic design you had no freaking idea that you were going to be able to put that on a blockchain and sell an nft and make hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars like nobody thought those things were going to come through so that's literally from people going in eh, why not and that is that is an incredible side and aspect to digital technologies and social media is yeah you, like anyone can just go um make something of themselves well, in a huge way people didn't want a centralized internet like man look at uh that tv show silicon valley like it's it's literally that and they didn't even show half of the things that their ai program could have been used for in the medical world like you because they didn't look at that and go why not hmm. like you just kind of have to look at it and people didn't want one thing didn't like how one thing was running looked at meta and facebook and went that's horrible man we should have our own and now there's how many so it's again just redirecting i don't like the way that i'm feeling right now redirected to go why not do something i like yeah that's gonna not make me feel that way um you know yeah that's that's an important thing kind of like talking about instagram or TikTok or whatever you're kind of part of it's you're seeing what the algorithm thinks you're gonna want to watch to spend the most amount of time in the app but then also you have some control over who you follow and who you don't follow and who you see and don't see so yeah, I've been trying to get better at like just using it as a tool and I like using Instagram. I love photography. I like sharing content. I like networking and learning from other people and interesting people on there. Um, but there's definitely a side to it that can be prone to, you know, especially if I wake up in the morning and look at my feed, that's the most terrible thing I can do because I feel yeah. like you're very uh, open to influence when you do, you're like, whoa, whoa, what's going on? I'm just like sleeping in another dimension. Like, okay, yeah. I'm just gonna look at this feed of like curated stuff totally. that probably isn't real. And we don't understand a lot of people, um, especially people who don't understand tech or the age of digitalization or whatever you wanna call it they don't understand how we've been trained and you know you see these trends that are like addiction to social media and your phone should be in the dsm5 um yeah but do you understand why the the business strategy that went into making this what it is and how reliant i am on it when i got my instagram shut down it rocked me and i was so upset and I realized it wasn't because of followers, because that's never, I don't care. Like if I get to 10K, I'm not gonna be a happy check. That's not gonna be a celebratory day for me. Um, I was really sad that I had lost the um, descriptions, like the captions, all of my educational ones, because I spent a lot of time telling a story about myself or educating other people that made a difference. The second one was the connections that I had because I used Instagram when we were traveling to get other people's accounts. So our international friends that we've made at hostels or whatever, I don't remember your handle. And those were the things that I was upset with and that, that bugged me more than anything. Um, I didn't care about, oh yeah. Well, it has know. a very real effect. And it you does. know, when you're, when you're putting so much in a company and you're like trusting a company to be like, hey, I'm gonna place my very real world human connections and entrust them over to you. I'm not gonna do anything that's 
wrong in the way of violence or obscenity or anything like that. You're not doing anything controversial. Like you're in a damn country where cannabis is fully legalized. You know, it's it's mind boggling that they would they would see you as I don't know what they see you as, but um, well, and it's this whole thing again. That is is it the algorithm? Is it someone targeting? Because we've we've definitely seen our fair share of people targeting in the Instagram industry, and I know for a fact. And man, Instagram, I do have to applaud you on your policy for privacy because there aren't apps or ways to investigate that anymore. We used to have that ability to go, who's messing with my shit? Because it gets to a point where you look at an industry or you look at the, that strategy um, and it's just to keep on shooting people down or to make people attached to it. And it's it's not good when it comes from either way in our, in our industry and everything. And it's just like, man, can we just get community back? Yeah. Because the fact that you're targeting other people doesn't mean that you are aligned with what cannabis actually stands for. Um, I always say the stoner community and the cannabis community are two very different things and people need to stop not being able to differentiate those things. Um, that whole, I'm in it just for the weed and the high and this is, I'm going to use recreational, be, that's not a great word, but it, they, they do it differently and they treat it differently. And, you know, I want to ask people who don't work in the cannabis industry but know about it or use cannabis and go, what do you know about the cannabis industry? From people who work in it, from what you've seen on the news, I'm really interested to hear what non-cannabis industry people have to say about that. What do you think the answer would be? I think one of the main ones would be it, it makes a lot of money. The industry itself makes a lot of money. That's not wrong. Health Canada. <laughs> that's not a cannabis industry, that's mm. government. Just been talking to Carol about you know the challenges around if you if you haven't been into the store yet into the weed store but we'll, we'll we'll go in this afternoon they have really reasonable pricing like really good pricing and um it's it's tough for it to be viable because you know they've got to come in line with the bc cannabis stores the government sponsored and the taxes man like all of this revenue or or they made this much in taxes like that money is going back to the government like sh let's again help out our homies like let's focus on that kind of stuff and that's mm. when these kind of things mess you up when you're restricted already in the industry that you work in and then you go to find let's say relief not the best word but relief on your phone and people don't understand that your phone has done the same thing is to train you to think that this is the way that it is and it's not going to change and i'm reliant on trying to improve or grow in whatever way in an environment that someone has set for me and not always in my best interest. So what do you mean by that? So if you're looking at the cannabis industry, the marketing thing, people are complaining about it. They're not going to do anything about it, but they're not understanding that it's not going to last a long time. So why not? So what, Have like uh, you're saying uh, for Instagram, they won't allow any like paid ads or anything like that on their, for cannabis on their platform. Or even just what you're supposed to post or not, or what you can put on your label or not. Yeah, it's very, it's very um, inconsistent. Do what you, know? you can. Like, like make it clear for people yeah, why. Yeah, like put a little extra something in it that isn't going to break anything with Health Canada. But I think it's just but a can of worms for them. Like it. it's easier for them to just try and sweep this under the carpet and not engage properly with it. And you see it time and time again yeah. in politics. You know, there's a group of people that um, what you know call out the government or say, "Hey, this is wrong." And instead of being like, "Okay, we'll debate you about this issue," they'll be like, "Well, you know, we've heard you're racist," and or whatever. You know, they'll they'll throw yeah. in some misdirection. They'll try and discredit that those people. You know, it's it's a very like still it's a very established playbook. Finding the direction going back to it, and so when it comes to things like web uh, web three or going into cannabis restrictions like things like Facebook or what we see as like a centralized 
space or our regulations in the cannabis industry, those things are going to be ever changing and people don't understand that. So in the time that we have in the middle of things, do it with, do stuff with what you're given, but do something different. Why not? Like there's people who are being smart looking at, I'm going to use like cannabis again, that you can look at, okay, we can't market, but we can do whatever we want with an age gate and an educational disclosure and throw whatever we want on our website. And then Why doesn't that way, everybody have a website? But in that way, you know, like I, th I think that the prohibition and the restrictions, they force an evolution within the industry. It's like that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah, and so that's why when you are looking at anything and looking at like digital stuff <laughs> and cannabis stuff, like it's just the way that you approach it with your thinking and it's really powerful when you can notice those little intricacies that can connect things and you know if you are super reliant on this or super reliant on how things are structured for you take advantage of it cool i'm gonna rock this shit no matter what <laughs> it's a great attitude to have like what's the worst thing that's gonna happen like i sent out my media kit to i don't know how many people i got to a point where i was like i'm just gonna cold call this shit it's like i'm gonna pick some people that i'm a huge fan of because the worst thing that could happen is they don't answer and I'm not going to be hung up about that. And that. That's been tough for me. I've really, I've really had to like teach myself to accept criticism or not necessarily criticism, more um, rejection and be able to not take it personally and be not repelled to go back to that area again and think, I'm just going to go do something else. I'm not good enough for yeah. this. Well, like, and there's probably a load of, go on. No, like I was just thinking earlier, before we even started, I was like, oh, I got this rejection email. Like, don't even send me an email. And you were like, no, I want to know. We're totally different in that because if, if I didn't hear back, I'm not going to think twice about it. See, yeah, I, <laughs> I definitely want to know. Um, I, when I'm, if I'm hiring people, I'll let someone know regardless, because I just think that's a polite thing to do. You don't leave someone hanging like, you know, and I understand, okay, if you have many, many candidates, but even then, you know, you can send a mass mail out blind yeah. copying. Like it's, it's very easy to do. So yeah, I've always been of the opinion, like I, I want to hear whether I've got the job or not. And also, yeah. you know, if I haven't got the job, I want some real feedback and okay, that's where if it's many, many people that yeah. I understand. Yeah. I mean, like it was probably over a dozen. Um, I heard back from majority of them and the ones that I didn't hear back from there obviously are a couple that I did go out a second time and I was like, Hey, haven't heard back, but because I want you, I want to, I want to work with you mm. and I'm, they, they are my priority. Um, but the ones that I put in there were kind of like shits and giggles. Let's see what happened. Nice. Like, so it's kind of like speculative and you've, you set your level of expectations. So no, you just gotta have fun with it. And like the worst that could happen is it doesn't. Okay. I can do more. Yeah. I, I think I'm a bit of a perfectionist sometimes. And so if I create something and then it, there's problems with it or you know it gets some bad feedback or it gets rejected the initial tendency is just to kind of like walk away from it and so i've had to really? i've had to yeah uh, i've had to teach myself to shift my perspective from an outcome to just a learning process and that's helped yeah. immensely you know like it, it's taken away my level of expectation but there was probably something before that made you think in that original process and then as time went on oh, you wanted yeah. to switch it because of what you were experiencing in oh, the yeah. moment i got i'm only child i'm i'm a male and therefore probably more likely to um not be too scared to show vulnerability yeah and have to like feel like i have to play all my emotions and be all like that and you know over the last five years or so I've completely switched like microdosing using mushrooms other plant-based medicines really oh, just yeah. like un 
clogged, like uncorked a, a thing in me, right? And yeah. let emotions to just pass through and be a lot more in tune with that. Um, and this is part of like, it's, that's had a whole plethora of yeah. impacts on my life. And I one of them is sense. just examining these things. Oh, actually like, I'm very like, yeah, I'm very sensitive to things. And that's just, I'm doing myself a disservice by doing that. And so just by changing from like, I have an expectation that I want to achieve this is like, that would be a cool thing to do. And you know, I, I, I believe I'll get there at some point if I just enjoy the journey and just learning like day yeah. to day. And, and a big thing is, you know, you look like a stock market ticker, right? Yeah. And you look, um, you zoom all the way out to like a five year view and it's like this big upward curve it's and you're really like sick. cool way of thinking about it. And like, you go to like the one day view and it's like all over the place, huge oh, yeah. downs, huge ups. Oh, and yeah, yeah, I'm thinking about it more in that kind of term. Day to day, I'm like, what the fuck's even going on here? That's a but great analogy for shrooms, man. Like I took some earlier and like, it's just, it's, it's a really good way of thinking about it. And I think people who do tend to lean into like the plants over pills life can at least understand this whole major development that you see in a lot of different ways when you start messing around with cannabis and shrooms and, and other plant-based substances. Um, not for me, those are too potent and I'm scared. Um, <laughs> but the microdosing life is fantastic. Um, and it really does help you, like when you say looking at your life, like it's a stock market graph. Most people are gonna go, oh yeah, because as life go on and your experiences and all of the things that you're doing and the stuff that you accumulate, and I know that that's not what you're talking about. It's, it's looking back and going, no, it's up here that's what I'm talking about when I'm going through this is my awareness, my understanding of all of those things accumulating in my life. And that's trippy. <laughs> it is, yeah. but yeah, it really, it gives you that, it does give you that awareness, that wider awareness where you just take yourself out of yourself a little bit. And yeah, like it's, it, a therapist can have exactly the same impact where, you know, like if you've been in therapy, they're, they're not realize. talking, they're, they're listening, but they'll ask little probing questions. They're just opening, they're all, it's all in you. Yeah. And the answers are already in you. They're just there to help facilitate that. And that's, that's what the plant-based medicine's doing in a whole it's bunch like of, from like a, that. like yeah. high dose to like a very subtle microdose. when, yeah, serendipity is the word I like to use with mm. these kind of things. Cause it's suddenly like, She's having these revelations and things. She's like, wow, this all fits together like a perfect puzzle piece and it I see does. it. It does. And it's, it's nice when those things kind of start to fall in place. Um, and I'm, I'm so excited for things like the MAPS program for that exact reason, because I've never been like the hardest stuff that I've ever done is I tried Adderall once, uh, and I did T3s in my like, grade 11. After that, I, I never touched a chemical substance and I was like, I never want to. And then in university, I knew I wanted to try Adderall before an exam when we were cramming just to see. That was the worst. I, Adderall did not work for me. It's kind of like meth, isn't it? Like essentially, yeah, it's pretty much Absolutely meth. horrible. I took like the tiniest, tiniest, like a quarter of a piece or something, but still I wanted to do everything but study. Uh, still ended up doing okay on the test, but it was like, it felt horrible because it didn't feel like me. And I so thought- how would do you describe the, the feelings? Like I, I literally would have done anything not to be in that library and study. I did everything in my power not to do what I was there to do. What, what would you have done if you were able to just leave? I tried sleeping under the table. Like I straight up, like I probably would have left to go exhaust myself and then sleep. Cause I was just done. So I was it was like, like a kind of energy. Yeah, I just, I just didn't like it. Mm. And the same with the T3s. Like I couldn't drive. I couldn't go to school because I was foggy and it felt weird. And I was like, mm -mm, this is not for me. But if the MAPS program worked out and me and my homie therapist, because yes, therapy does rock people. Um, <laughs> if I was able to go and properly have an administration of LSDM or ketamine or whatever in a safe space with a professional, <laughs> then I would be open to trying something. But going out and doing it, 
absolutely not. My brain does not need that extra stimulation. I will have a microdose and a lot of edibles and I will be very happy. Nice. Yeah. Well, and you can go down now in Vancouver and do a ketamine infusion. Yeah. However, you need 5,000 bucks to throw at it. So that's the one in Toronto. The, it's this 10K. Is the next, oh, this is the next problem is the, the accessibility and it not being yeah. available to probably the people who need it most. Um, but steps in the right direction one thing at a time right yes and when you look at things like maps programs like to have a therapist office like you could just like sub doc and then just hang out yeah. here and, you've got to train and it could be the same there. as like when i go on a regular day you know like it's it's cool like that but being able to ingest is much better and just healthy for you all around absolutely well we're Pretty much at our time, and I, t I wanted to like talk to you about edibles today. So I guess that just means we're gonna have to have another conversation at some point down the well, road. We just gotta come and we'll do this while cooking. Exactly, that sounds good. Let's do yeah. it. But uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you on um, and talking to you. And guys, check out Ali. We'll put in the show no notes a uh, link for freelance services. Highly recommended. <laughs> thank you. See you on the next one. Thank Cheers. you so much.